Well, hey, guys, we are in week two of this series, Thriving in Exile, in case you don't read that and already see that there, um, where we started last week, where we were kind of just going through this book, First Peter, in the Bible, and we're just breaking it down chapter by chapter. So last week, um, kind of everything today is kind of almost like a part two of what we talked about last week. So if you missed last week, Joel, our lead pastor, you should go back and check out that message. I'm not just saying that because he's making me right now. Um, but no, you should go back and check that message because this is going to be almost like a Quentin Tarantino movie if you haven't seen this because you're going to see the ending and then later you can go back and see the beginning. So... All I have to say is, in case you missed last week, or in case we've all slept since then, hopefully, which is everyone, I'm going to give you just the real quick recap of kind of what we talked about last week, what Joel talked about last week, and specifically is talking about our identity as believers, our kind of our identity in Christ. And he said specifically, there are, he said this Henry Nouwen quote, which on a side note is like one of my favorite quotes of all time, but he said specifically that we can sometimes find our identity in the things that we have, maybe how big our bank account is, maybe how nice our car is. Sometimes we find our identity in what other people say about us. And sometimes we even find it in like the things that we do and maybe the accomplishments that we have. And then he even tagged on an extra one, specifically saying, I am what my heart tells me, like kind of where our emotions are kind of following your heart, kind of like that Disney story. And talked about how all of those things might work for a little bit, but they don't really hold up in the long term. And so today, this morning, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be talking about what we, our lives should look like as we have our identity in Jesus. And so as we're doing that, I wanted to start us out with a question, and hopefully this brings you guys some happy memories. Have you ever been on a team or in a community before that you just loved being in? Maybe it's for sports, maybe it's for like a work group you're in, or like school, or friends, or hopefully your family, you at least have some of this. Do you have like a group of people that you've just loved to be a part of um, at some point in your life? Um, For me, um, as I was thinking about this, um, this week I was thinking of, I used to run cross country um, in high school, which I know, a little surprising, don't look like a guy who'd run cross country. Um, Yeah, I have proof, here's a picture of, uh, I'm the big goofy one in the middle that's literally standing on his tiptoes, so I wanted to prove I was taller than everyone else. Um, and I also have hair in that picture, which is kind of weird to even look back on now. <laughs> so, sorry that you have to see that. Um, but one thing that you probably don't know about my experience across country is even though I ran all four years, I was probably to say the, the kindest way I could put it is my cross country kind of career was more of a disappointment than anything else. Like I started running my freshman year and my PR, like my best time happened in my freshman year. It never, I never got any better. I ran JV all four years. Um, I never one time scored an actual point for our team. That's how bad of a runner I was. And I still kept coming back. But the reason I did, because I, there was never a moment where I felt like I was any less important to that team. Like, my best friend at the time was, like, the best runner on the team, the one that was going to state, winning, doing all those things. And there was never a moment where I thought he's more important to this team than I am. That even the best and the worst runner, we were still all in. And I think a lot of times that is what it is, like when we have that community that we love being a part of, right? There's that feeling of like, man, we are all in. There's nobody here on the outside. Or sometimes it's even as simple as like kind of working for something bigger than yourself. And on the flip side, sorry to bring this down a little bit longer, a little bit farther, but um, we also have moments, right, where you didn't really feel like you belonged in a group, right? Like you were there and you participated, but it kind of felt like you were on the outs. Maybe it's, again, some of those same areas. Maybe it's sports, maybe it's work, maybe it's school, friends, family. Maybe like you had a group of friends where there's all these unspoken rules that you had to follow and they didn't really say them. And it was things like you have to, on Wednesdays, you have to wear pink. Um, Sorry, that's just my thrown in Mean Girl reference for this week. Um, So if you're keeping a track, that's number one. Um, So yeah, so maybe you just have that group of friends that you feel like you don't live up to or that group, whatever it is, you feel like maybe you're not good enough. You're not performing enough. You're not doing enough to be like a real kind of person, a real member of that group. But because you don't really feel like you have anywhere else to go, you kind of just stay in there and kind of just like, well, I don't have any other options. I'm just staying here. I'm just going to kind of stick with this group. 
Um, and unfortunately, I think when this gets really dangerous, especially is when we kind of look at faith communities and we look at our faith, and that it is so easy sometimes for us to kind of look at everyone else and the things that they're doing and go, oh yeah, my faith doesn't really measure up to what that, like my faith doesn't measure up to what they're doing, what they have. And because of that, it can sometimes make us feel like maybe I don't belong. Like there's something different here. Um, and just as a side note, um, if that's where you're at, if you're in a place where your faith, like you're like, I don't really know exactly what I believe. I feel like maybe I'm kind of on the outs because maybe my life isn't as together as everyone else here. Um, number one, we got you fooled real good. <laughs> and, uh, but no, we are so glad that you're here. That we, Bridgeway, part of what we want to be is we want to be a place where people that are following Jesus and people who are like, I don't even know if I like Jesus. I don't even know if I believe he's a real person. Like, even those people, we want you to feel like you can be here, that you can belong no matter what. And that there's a reason we have that sign right here as you walk into the auditorium that says, no perfect people allowed. Because if everyone here was perfect, everyone had their lives together, uh, we can might as well just go home. We're like, what else we got going on? And if there's only perfect people in here, I know I wouldn't be on stage. We wouldn't have anyone leading the church. We would have no staff. It would be a problem. So all of that to say is um, the passage I want to look at this week that's going to kind of go into this. Again, last week we were in the first chapter of First Peter. I'm going to be in the second chapter of First Peter. Um, and so just as a quick backdrop to this, um, even though we call it a book, um, it was actually originally a letter. So this was actually a ri- originally a letter. Can anybody guess who wrote the letter called First Peter? <laughs> yeah, it's Peter. Spoiler, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, it's this guy named Peter. He was actually a follower of Jesus. He spent time with Jesus. Um, He's one of my favorite people um, as I'm reading the stories about Jesus because um, he always is putting his foot in his mouth. Like he's always the guy that just says whatever's on his mind. And so sometimes like he gets like the rock star answers and Jesus is like, yes, you're right, way to go. And other times he says like the dumbest things. And I'm like, all right, if he could hang with Jesus, like I think we could, I could hang there. That'd be good. Um, But so at this time in history, uh, the Christians are in exile. They're scattered all over the place. Uh, they have this, uh, this Roman um, emperor who's kind of like persecuting all of them. It's not a great situation for them. Um, and so what Peter is doing is he's writing this letter that they were then going to pass around to a lot of the different churches around there, like different gr- church groups, and kind of giving them hope. Saying like, hey, I know everything's going really bad right now. I know this feels like this is hopeless, but here's the hope. Here's what you can hold on to. And so that's kind of the backdrop for what we're going to hear today. So again, because we're going to look at our identity, here we go. Uh, the first verse of First Peter chapter 2. He says, therefore, and I have that highlighted because normally you're like, that's just the word we read over. We don't actually read that. But what it, why I highlighted that, why I think it's so important is because he's saying, therefore, because of everything we said, because of everything I said in the last chapter, because of your identity in Christ, basically, he says, therefore, get rid of all ill will and all deceit, pretense, envy, and slander. It's a whole list of things, right? Um, there's actually a, a paraphrase of this passage uh, by this guy named Eugene Peterson. And I think, uh, for me, at least it connects a lot. This is what it says. He says, so clean house, make a clean sweep of malice, pretense, envy, and hurtful talk. He basically says like, hey, get the junk out of your lives. And if you're looking at that list and you're like, oh, um, there's a kind of, I got a lot of things in my life that aren't on that list. This is not a comprehensive list, all right? Like this isn't like, oh, well, I'm pretty greedy, but he didn't list it. So I guess I don't got to work on that. No, 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 no. He is not giving us a comprehensive list. If you're thinking of something right now in your life, add that to the list. Like, that can be added. Go ahead, add it to it. Um, But yeah, so uh, what he's saying here is basically for all of us, like, we need to, as Jesus followers, kind of take a moment and self-assess, right? Kind of look at your lives and figure out what your toxic traits are. Like, what's that thing that everybody else knows? And let me just give you a hint. That toxic trait is not that when you go and get fast food for your family, you eat the fries out of everyone else's boxes so that when you get home, you have more fries still in your box. Um, It didn't look like you touched the rest. No, 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 that's not your toxic trait. And your toxic trait isn't that you steal all the covers at night and then everyone else has to like just not get covers. No, 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 those aren't your toxic traits. Um, what Peter is saying, like, hey, you need to self-analyze and figure out what are the areas in your life that you need to fix? Where are those weaknesses that you have? Um, And if 
you are like, I have literally no clue what those are. Um, I'm going to throw this out there. Talk to your spouse. Talk, talk to your partner. Talk to your best friend. Talk to someone who's going to tell you the truth because I promise they're there. Everyone else knows about them. You may not know. And don't do like that nudge to them right now. Like, yeah, yeah, all those things I hate about you. Yeah, yeah. Don't do that right now. But later, ask them, hey, what are some of these things that I need to get out of my life? Because Nico said that. I don't think I have it. I think I'm pretty perfect. No, 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 no. You're going to find out you're not. Um, yeah, we're going to keep going here in this next verse. So he, he starts with that. says, take these things out. And then he continues. And he says, instead, like a newborn baby... Desire the pure milk of the word, nourished by it. You will grow into salvation. And since you have tasted that the Lord is good. And I love this because Peter starts us out with basically like this list of like, hey, take these things out. Don't do these things. And then he starts going like, hey, but don't just take these things out. He says, also, I want you to add this to your life. As a reminder, again, he's writing this to believers, people who are Jesus followers, because again, why would you want to change any of these things if you weren't a Jesus follower, right? He says, no, 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 these are for people who are following Jesus. And I think it's really important that he did both of these, because I think so often, especially when we start following Jesus and we kind of start our faith journey, um, a lot of times when we look at it, and I remember specifically in high school always feeling this way, is it kind of just feels like a big list of rules, right? Right? It feels like that list of like, no drinking, no smoking, no lying, no cheating, no sex, no fun, basically overall, like no fill in the blank. Like I remember so many times, like especially when I was younger in my faith going, yeah, it kind of looks like they're having all the fun and I just have this big list of things I can't do. But what Peter is pointing out to us, which is so much bigger than that, is he says this, is that holiness, like kind of following Jesus, becoming like Jesus, isn't just making a list of things that we can't do. It's, live, it's about what we get to do. It's about living in our freedom. It's about the things that we get to do because of our faith kind of changing our directions. Like, it's not just like going, all right, if these are the things I'm not supposed to do, it's not about just not walking there anymore. It's about also just stopping going, you know what? I'm gonna turn and go the opposite way towards good things. It's about changing our focus. Um, And I think a lot of times when we get to this part of faith, for a lot of us, this is where it kind of starts to break down a little bit, if we're gonna be honest. Because this is, again, where we get back to where we can almost feel like we're on the outside Because you're looking around, you're like, man, am am I doing enough in my faith? Like, am I really doing what I'm supposed to do? Because, like, my list of don'ts is still real big. And, like, I'm still struggling to follow even some of those. And then you look at maybe your list of things that you're trying to do. And you're like, yeah, these, I don't really feel like my list is as big as some of the other things. Like, I helped someone, like, three weeks ago. But I don't know. Am I really, am I really on par for where I'm supposed to be? And I think really quickly, when we get into that place, we can kind of get into like we feel less than kind of place, right? And then all of a sudden we feel like we're kind of on the outside of where our faith is supposed to be. Um, And I think if that's where you're at, um, and I've been there plenty of times, um, to be honest, I think you're kind of in a place where like you're not really seeing faith like how it really is. Um, I think there's kind of these two ways that we can see our faith, um, at least in this context. And one of them is like an HOA. A homeowner's association. Um, I'm going to be honest, I have never been a part of a homeowner's association, but everyone I've ever talked to who is, it sounds like a nightmare. (laughs) Sorry if you run a homeowner's association. Sorry if you really love rules and you are like, I'm about my homeowner's association. If you've got a different experience, please let me know. Um, But everyone I've ever talked to, it sounds like a nightmare. It's literally like a just giant list of rules that you have to follow whether you agree with them or not. Um, It sounds like meetings that you got to go to and kind of awkwardly sit with your neighbors that you don't really talk to normally, but now you got to act like you're going to make decisions together. Um, It's like this whole list of rules. And then it's kind of like if you don't follow these rules, which I did read this week, there are some HOAs that then can kick you out of your house if you're not following the rules. But obviously in most extreme, in most circumstances, it's just like you're going to get that awkward glance every time your neighbor walks by. Like, yeah, you didn't mow your yard enough this week. Your yard enough? You didn't mow your yard. Yeah, I said that right. So I thought I said that backwards for a second. (laughs) 
Um, he said, yeah, you kind of get that awkward glance of like, you don't really belong here. And like, you kind of give them that back. But yeah, you instantly kind of feel on the outs because there's this list of rules that you're like, you know what, if I'm not really following these, I'm not really kind of in with the group. It's kind of that feeling of like empty old religion where it's just this big list of rules. And if you're not doing it, you aren't really kind of a part of this whole thing. Instead of an HOA, like in those moments, we need to start to kind of train our bodies. We got to start training our minds to think of our faith more as a relationship. And I think when you see it more as a relationship, not just a list of rules, all of a sudden you start to see it more like a family instead of an HOA. Because I know everyone here has like maybe a different experience for your family and like kind of how you were brought up or anything else. But we all have like that picture of like how a family is supposed to be. We all have that picture of how we are supposed to like, no matter how much you mess up, like you are part of the family, right? Um, this is one of those things that like for, uh, for me, it's been a really big deal with my sons. Um, I'm always trying to make sure that no matter what, I want them to make sure they know that they can always talk to me about anything and that nothing they ever do is going to mess up anything. Um, and so every day um, before they go to school, um, and sometimes I do it even before like some of their soccer games because they're really good at sports and I know sports can kind of consume like how you feel about yourself. Um, but before they go to school, I'll literally, I just take them and I, they kind of do like the, my older son's now is in middle school, so he's getting to be too cool. Um, but <laughs> that's how it goes. Uh, but then I'll always look and go, hey, you ready? And I look them right in the eyes and say, I love you and I'm proud of you no matter what. And like sometimes he'll be like, okay, okay, and like kind of move on. And other times, like I kind of got to feel like I got to add a little bit to it to kind of mess with him because I know he's like kind of acting like this in that series. So I'll even say like, I'll add things in like, hey, no matter if you have the best day of your life or the worst day, I want you to know that I am proud of you. Or like, hey, even if you get all A's or like you're sitting in class and you literally poop your pants today, even then, guess what? I just want you to know you're going to come home and I'm still going to love you and I'm still going to be proud of you no matter what. Like that is true about you. And that if you're going into a game, like I don't care if you score a thousand goals or you score 10 goals for the other team, which I don't know how you would do that. Sounds like a nightmare. But even if you do that, guess what? I love you and I'm proud of you no matter what. And some of you guys, like you need to hear that. Like maybe right now in your faith, you feel like you're on the outs because you haven't quite lived up to even what your own expectations are for your faith and for your own kind of life. And I'm here to tell you that God does not see you as a disappointment, that God loves you and he's proud of you no matter what. And what's amazing is that when someone really believes that, when we really believe that and when we take that to heart, guess what? It starts to change us. Like all of a sudden, we're doing our best, not because we have to, not because we have to prove ourselves, not because we have to earn it, because it comes out of like, oh, I'm loved, like I just want to be my best self. Not because I have to be, not because I, you know, want, I, you're making me, but because I want to be my best self. It's something that we don't have to earn. So let's go on, keep going in this passage, this next part, verses four and five. Peter continues, and this is what he says. Now you are coming to him as, a living, as to a living stone. Even though this stone was rejected by humans, from God's perspective, it is chosen, valuable. You yourselves are being built like living stones into a spiritual temple. You're being made into a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to be honest. Um, when I first read this passage, I don't know, probably sometime in high school, I was like, I literally have no clue what this guy is talking about. Like, I was like, he's talking about stones, and like, stones are obviously not living. What's he talking about? A temple? Like, this whole thing would have been like a verse where I've been like, I don't understand this. And if you're there, I'm going to give you, um, we're going to walk through it a little bit and kind of some of the meaning. Um, but at least for me, one of the things that always helps is when I know like when he's using an analogy or like a metaphor. And so when he's saying living stone, when he's talking about stone being rejected, Peter is talking about Jesus. Like he's saying like, hey, you know, the world rejected Jesus and because of that, and then he's going to continue to go into it. 
Um, but we're going to get there. But first, to kind of understand this passage, you have to understand a little bit of the backdrop. And this is where it's going to get a little heady. So give me like two minutes. Strap in. Can you guys strap in? Can we do this? Can we do this? Everyone, I want this motion. Yeah. Strap in. People in line, I expect to see that you're strapping in. Go ahead and text it in the chat. Um, yeah, so go ahead, strap in. Here we go. Throw up this picture. This is the temple. So for uh, the Israelite people, for God's people at the time, this is where God and earth like met. This is like where the presence of God, like they believe just like we do that God is everywhere. But kind of like in a different way, there was like a room inside of this that had this giant real thick curtain in front of it that was called the Holies of Holies. It was where God's presence was. Um, Does anybody remember Venn diagrams from like school? Anybody? Yes, hands? Yes, yes, yes. Venn diagrams, those two big circles that overlapped. And like on this side would be dogs. You say cool, cute, awesome. And this side would be cats. You say the worst. They smell. (laughs) Pee. I don't know. But in the middle where those two circles overlapped was where you wrote the things that were similar, right? These were the things where they matched up. And in this moment, For the temple, this is like, you could basically have made a Venn diagram of this is earth, this is heaven, and the temple would have been the one place in the middle. It was a place where they matched up together. And so in that, this is what they, like they couldn't just go anywhere just to worship God. This is where they were going to worship God. And just like today, there was these priests, and depending on how, or kind of the church tradition you come from, when you hear priests, you might kind of just think of like the Catholic church, but priest is kind of just like someone who worked at the temple. These were people who were doing the work of God, while everyone else kind of was on the sidelines just watching, kind of just watching this whole thing happen. And once a year specifically, they would have one of the priests would have to go in there, get to kind of do like this big sacrifice, get to be in the presence of God and get to walk out. Well, again, everyone else was just on the outside going, hey, don't mess this up, man. You're our only guy going in there. Please go, go, go. And then Jesus all of a sudden shows up on the scene. And he completely changes everything because he starts talking about tearing down the temple. He starts talking about how like in three days, this temple isn't going to be standing, which you can imagine why that would make people mad, right? Like if this is like the one place that you've always known, this is where the presence of God is. And Jesus walks up and goes, this place is going to be teared down in like three days. (laughs) You're like, man, how, why would you say that? And it's because Jesus knew something so much bigger than they all knew is that Jesus, when he entered the scene, he became the new temple. He became the new place where God and earth kind of combined and became into like one being. Um, But what's beautiful about this story, um, and I always feel like it's almost like a twist because it doesn't sound beautiful, is that like when Jesus died, that all changed. Because you're like, why, why would that be good when Jesus dies? Because all of a sudden, that big curtain was torn open. That was right there in front of the Holy Soviet. In this temple was torn open. And then because of that, kind of like a firework shooting into the sky, that kind of being the temple, being in God's presence, wasn't just in one place. It wasn't just in the temple. It wasn't just in Jesus. Instead, it shot out to all of his followers. It was like after he came back and he ascended into heaven, um, Jesus' followers, they had like this little room and they were kind of nervous, like, what are we supposed to do? Like the ringleader's gone. What are we supposed to do now? And they're just praying. And this crazy thing happens. And to be honest, I wish every single time that there was like a real picture of this because it sounds absurd. But they're literally praying. And all of a sudden, the Bible says, we read this in the book of Acts, that tongues of fire come down from heaven and land on them, and give them the presence of God. And what happens is that that continues into today, that everyone here who is a Jesus follower, we get to be the presence of God, because we have the Holy Spirit, God, working inside of us. And so going back, can we throw that passage back up there that we just had, 1 Peter uh, 4, 5? Yeah, so it goes into this, and you can look at it either way, because I think both of these verses get us to the same place. He says, you yourselves are being built up like living stones into a spiritual temple. So you can kind of view yourself as a stone that is being part of this big temple, that we are all part of this thing. Or, I like this one a little bit better, because I don't like being pictured myself as a rock. Um, You are being made into a holy priesthood. And so what Peter is saying is like, hey, 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 
there isn't just like the one guy or the two guys or whoever it is that get to be the priest now. No, 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 no. He says, we all, anyone who's a Jesus follower, you all get to be the priest. We all get to be in on the action. We don't have to be on the outside just cheering. We get to be a part of it. It's kind of like this. It's kind of like for Jesus followers, it's not if you are called to ministry in fact, it's kind of changes. It's actually, it's where and how you are called. Like every single one of us. It's not if you are called. If you're here and you're a Jesus follower, it's just more about figuring out where God's already calling you right now. Um, and just like any other role, this role comes with a responsibility. Check this out, verses 9 and 10. He says, but you are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people who are God's own possession. You have become this people so that, so you have become this people of God, you've become this holy priesthood, this royal priesthood, so that you may speak of the wonderful acts of the one who called you out of darkness into his amazing light. Once you weren't a people, but now you are God's people. Once you hadn't received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And what I love about this is that what it doesn't say right there is it doesn't say like you have become his people so you can just watch what everyone else is doing. Or it doesn't say you have become his people so you can just cheer on the pastors and the people who are like, like on staff at the church officially. No, 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 no. He says, hey, we all get to be a part of it. We all get to have our role. But what's funny is that it still feels like so often, you can throw up that next picture, this is more what we turn into, right? Like, we might even have the jersey from the team, but we're just in the stands instead of getting into the game, instead of joining into where God is calling us. And if you've never experienced it, if you've never got to be a part of a team, I'm just going to say it this way, it is so much better being in the game than being the person in the stands. Like, I know, like, I get excited. I have teams that I really love, and I cheer on, and I get excited. But I guarantee it doesn't even compare to being the person, like, actually playing in the game. Um, One of my favorite things to do, um, like, especially, like, after the Super Bowl or after, like, a big game, I love to hear, like, the the players talk about it afterwards. And I'm going to tell you, like, the level of excitement that they get is absurd. Like, I have straight up seen quarterbacks holding, like, three kids going, this is the happiest day of my life. And I'm like, what is wrong with you? (laughs) And, like, I'm like, yeah, man, I'm excited. I'm probably going to feel this buzz for, like, two weeks. But then after that, it's going to fade pretty quick. But, like, you're straight up taking days off. You're going to Disney World. You're doing all these things. And, like, it's just a different reality, right? But so many of us, that's what we're choosing, We're choosing, like, even though we have this invitation to be in the game, we're like, nah, I'm going to stay here. (laughs) I'm going to stand here. I'm going to cheer because it's safe. I don't want to get my hands messy. I don't know, maybe put a little makeup on my face. But, like, for some of us, like, um, and fun little fact, back in 2007, the Indianapolis Colts won the Super Bowl. I know sometimes we got to celebrate things. We haven't had a lot of things to celebrate. (laughs) Um, But back in 07, that was, like, when they were, like, at their peak, you could say. And, like, this would be, like, if you were, like, in the stands cheering and Peyton Manning, the quarterback of the Colts, is just sitting next to you going, let's go team, right? We'd be like, what are you doing, man? Get in the game. Like, you're, like the, you're the MVP. We need you in there. And what Peter is saying and what Jesus is saying is, like, hey, get out of the stands. We need you in the game. We need you to be a part of this. Because no kid, if they love sports, grows up saying, hey, I can't, someday I want to be a fan of the the Indiana Pacers. No, right? They say, I want to be on the Indiana Pacers. I want to be a player. So what are we doing? What does this mean for us? Well, I think two things. Um, I think the first thing is simply this. The question that we need to ask ourselves, it kind of continues off of last week, but you really got to have this grounded before you can move forward, is where's your identity coming from? Like, for you, like, personally, where's your identity coming from? Um, And if you're here, and if you're like, you know what, I'm not really a Jesus follower. I'm not even sure if I even, again, don't even know if I care about the guy or if he even has good ideas. If that's you, like, I think this is still a great question for you. Because no matter what, 
everyone's getting their identity from something. And so for you, you probably should at least know, like, what is that thing that's going to cause you kind of grief or excitement, whatever it is in your life? Because if it's tied up in things like work, if it's tied up in things like how much money is in your bank account, I promise, like, work might even go good for a few years. Maybe you are killing it. But there are going to be days when those, those like, compliments don't come in. There are going to be days when it doesn't go as well. And you don't want your identity to be shaped in something that can change so often. But if you're here and you're like, hey, Jesus is my identity, number one, we need to kind of kind of keep checking ourselves on that. Because even though I 100% will say all day long that Jesus is my identity, man, all the time throughout the day, I will get caught up in what somebody else thinks. I will get caught up in like maybe what I don't have or what I think I should have. And so for all of us, we need to kind of keep kind of gut checking ourselves on that. Like, where is your identity really coming from? Is it coming from Jesus or is it coming from something else? And then kind of the second thing for us, for all of us, is simply this, asking ourselves this question, are you in the game? Like, are you in the game or are you just standing on the sides cheering on? And I think um, there's three things that we can kind of look at in our own lives to kind of see if we're in the game. The first one is simply this, are you sharing what God is doing? Like, in your life, like, are you sharing with the people around you, maybe at work, maybe um, at school, maybe with friends, family, whoever it is, even when sometimes, let's be honest, it gets a little awkward, even in those moments, like, are you sharing what God is doing in your life? And not in like a, in like the, hey, I'm right, you're wrong kind of way, but just in a way where you're like, hey, um, do with this what you will, but like, this is how God's changing me right now, and my life wouldn't be the same without him. And it doesn't have to be like, hey, you're wrong if you don't believe me. It can just be like, hey, this is what God's doing. And the second thing is, are you loving others? Like, would other people look at you if you ask the people around you, would they say you're a loving person? Would they say you are someone that shows kindness to others? Um, I think for, there's a couple different ways. Obviously, like, this is huge, like, in our work life, right? This is huge, like, whether you are someone who works in a church or someone who doesn't, like, we are all called to serve others, to love others. Um, early on, when I uh, first um, started working at the very first church I ever got to work at, I was, like, one year out of college. I was still so young and had literally, I thought I knew everything. I literally didn't know anything, um, and I remember there was this guy, he was an awesome volunteer, and he was an insurance agent. And I remember there was something about me that was like, he should be doing so much more with his life. And so like one day, as like an arrogant 22-year-old, I was like, hey, why do, you, why do you just do this insurance stuff? Like, why don't you like get like a real job and like work at a church? <laughs> I know it sounds opposite, but you probably think most of the time. Um, but like, I was like, why don't you like, you do so much good. Like, why are you wasting it here at an insurance agency? Why don't you come work at a church with, like with me? And I remember, like, him looking me in the eyes, he goes, are you crazy? Like, I am doing just as much as you are every single day. He said, and I remember, he said, I not only get to help people, like, when they have these bad things happen to me, happen to them, but, like, on their worst days, like, when they get in a car wreck, when, like, a tornado rips through their house, when they have floods, like, guess what? They call me, and I get to go and be there with them. I get to serve alongside them. I even get to help them out financially because of insurance through all of these things and get to pour hope into them. And I remember like, it was like that light bulb moment of, oh, oh man, I'm an idiot. <laughs> like we are all, we all have that role and that responsibility. So wherever you're at right now, no matter whether you love your job, whether it's temporary or not, like where can you find ways to show love and kindness to others? Where is ways that you can show Jesus' light to others? Um, and as another little side note to this one, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't say, like, one of the other ways that I think is really important for us to serve is just having it as, like, a rhythm on our calendar. Um, for me, I know that um, I serve people a lot when I want to serve them, Right? It's really easy to show love and kindness to somebody when you feel like doing it. But let's be honest, like, I don't know, maybe it's just I'm a grumpy old man already. Uh, but like, the older I get, the less and less I really kind of want to help people sometimes. Like, sometimes I'm like, you know what, I just want to kind of be by myself. I just want to be with my family. I just want to do these things. 
And I think one of the most powerful things that's kind of shaped my faith is that like since high school, I have almost always had like a rhythm of like serving either in a local church or at like a nonprofit to like when I had to get up, like there are days where I had to get up and like serve kids, serve students. Guess what? I didn't really want to be there. I like, I was tired, I was exhausted, and yeah, for sure, there are days that I love being there, but there are days where, just like everyone else in this room, I wake up and I'm like, yeah, I don't really feel like doing that. I kind of just want to sleep in and watch the news and drink some coffee, but the most powerful moments are those moments where I'm like, hey, but I've already committed to this. I'm already committed to them. I am going to show up faithfully anyways, and that is when I've really seen change happen, not only in the lives of others, but in my own heart. So for you, like, do you have that as like a regular rhythm on your calendar? And like, I know it's really easy because we're here in the middle of Bridgeway to go, oh, like, he's just trying to get me to serve at Bridgeway. That's fine. Like, don't serve at Bridgeway if you don't want to. Like, don't sign up to serve. Like, go find another nonprofit in this town. Go find another mission that you can believe in and sign up to serve with them. I'm not just trying to promote what we're doing here, which it is awesome. You should totally join us. But I'm just saying, like, I want what's best for you, and it has not had me just trying to trick you into serving more. It's about what I think is really going to be the best for you. Are you in the game? And the last one um, is just simply this. Are you growing? Like for you, are you growing? Are you growing in your faith? Or kind of like we talked about earlier, are you still just drinking from that bottle? Like it's real cute when you see a baby drinking from a bottle. You're like, ah, it is real weird if you saw me as a 35-year-old man up here drinking from a bottle, right? But that is like literally like what some of us have been doing. Like we kind of had like that initial thing that we never really moved past it. We never really grew. And so for you, like look at your own life. Like if you look back six months ago, a year ago, five years ago, like do you feel like you've grown? Because like I'll be honest, I always like when I even think five years ago, I'm like, ooh, it gets real cringy when I think about some of the choices I made. And I'm like, it, the cringe is actually good in this, in this scenario. Because if I'm looking back and see cringe, I'm like, I don't know if I should have done that. Guess what? That means I'm growing. That means we're moving forward. So for you, like, are you growing? Can you see that in yourself? So today, if you're here as a Jesus follower, as God's royal priesthood, we get the honor to be God's presence in the world. We get to be in the game. And instead of hiding in our homes full of fear and doubt, in this crazy way that Jesus works, because I'll be honest, I would have never probably picked this option if I was him. But he says, hey, 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 you don't just get to be bystanders. You get to be a part of what God is doing in this world. And what's beautiful and we'll see it over and over, is that Jesus uses our brokenness to heal the world, and that Jesus uses our ordinary lives to do the extraordinary, and Jesus is calling every single one of us. And so the question is, like, are we just going to continue to watch others? Are we just going to continue to sit in the fan section? And maybe you're the craziest fan and no one would doubt you. And like, I wouldn't even come near you because you're a little scary. But maybe what we need to be doing is saying yes to getting in that game. Because you already got their jersey on anyways. You might as well hop in and get to experience the real freedom, the real adventure, and the best cause that you could ever be a part of that Jesus is calling all of us to.